It's July 18th, 2012, we're in Newport Beach at the studio of Gene Allen, Academy Award winner, production designer for some of the greatest movies ever made. And I'm so thrilled to be here as I've been an admirer of your work and studied it for many, many years. And what a thrill to sit across the table from a president of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, as I said before, an Academy Award winner, and one of the best production designers that Hollywood has ever known. One of my favorite movies my whole life was the 1954 film A Star is Born, starring Judy Garland and James Mason. Of course, it was George Cukor's first Technicolor Cinemascope musical. And who was the production designer for that historic and great film? None other than yourself, Gene Allen. Would you please tell us about how that came about and how you got that job? It's interesting. You have to know a little bit about the movie business, but there are people called sketch artists. And we're hired by an art department to work with art directors in their departments. And what we do is they come in and give us four pages, three pages, and say, draw this up. And so you try to contribute to what the director, which is twice removed from you, can do. And we understand making movies, so we say, well, you know, if you start low and you end up tall and you the lights from here and you do all that. That's what a sketch artist does to the art director. The art director doesn't allow you to sign your sketches because he goes to the director with these sketches and they think that's hit the art director's work. So you don't get credit for those drawings? The, the, not at all. They're not recorded anywhere and it was a the art directors themselves had that sort of rule against allowing sketch artists to do that because they, it naturally takes away from the art director. But anyway, I was a sketch artist at Fox. Business slowed down. I got laid off. Went over to Warner Brothers. Checked in the art department. Got a job in the art department. and As a sketch artist. As a sketch artist. And they assigned me to My Fair Lady which at that time was being designed by Lem Ayers, a very famous... You, very, mean a, you mean a Star is Born, not My Fair Lady. Did I say... I'll do, mean, I, I'll do that all born. through this interview. That's okay. So, Star, so Star is Born, you to absolutely. Star, Lem Ayers start, assigned you to I Star is Born. I assigned me to work with Lem Ayers on A Star is Born. And the story with that very quickly was that Cukor liked Lem, but he said, hey, you don't know anything about making a movie. Evident in the speeches that they had, so he asked Lem. Was Lem more of a Broadway guy then? Is that the yeah? Concept? Well, he was. He was a great Broadway, Broadway guy. But he, and but he had done a movie or so. But Cukor just very. I learned very soon. But movies what, what, and Broadway what, are completely different. Kind of different it has nothing to do. One has very little to do with the other. Especially with somebody like Cukor, who had done you know, everything from Garbo to all the Tracy Hepburn pictures oh, and all before this. The women. Yeah, my goodness, he had a list of pictures. Anyway, so I went and made a couple of sketches for Lem. Lem says, Cukor wants me to take somebody to the next production meeting that knows something about movies. Do you know, are you good at that? And I said, yes, that's what I do. So we did. We went to a production meeting, I sat there, listened the whole way. Uh, and Cukor was leading this production Cukor meeting. Cukor was leading, they have it, they make makeup, sound, Camera, everybody's so there. So everybody in the film is sitting around a sitting table. Sitting around on a table. And Cukor is like the president. Pre-production. And they want to know what's going to happen in the first few days, weeks of this picture. What are you going to make? What are you going to do? What's going to be ready on time and so forth? I sat and listened and uh, had never seen Cukor and uh, knew little, very little about him. Sketch artist is down the ladder quite a way, right. so you weren't. You're not some hero. You don't get any credit. No, no credit. So I listened, and Cukor at the end said, well, anybody else got anything to say? I said, yes, sir. Uh, I read two scripts on Stars Born, and the one you're not using had a great scene and, and the way it was handled, and you're not doing that in the new thing. And Cukor makes that big face and says, oh, you think so, do you? And I thought, here I go. I'm going to be back out in the street again. At no job here. Anyway, the next day, they have what they call blue pages for the script. And in came blue pages with that change in the scene that I had suggested. Not 
to direct your, you know, not really talking directly to direct Q Coral, although he was, but I didn't know what I was doing. I was not, not in that position before. Anyway, so I, I always say overnight, uh, we made that change, and then I worked for QCOR the next 17 years because he liked the change. He liked what, why I did it. Do you it. remember what? this specific change? Oh, can, yeah. Can you tell sure. us yeah. what that was, please? It was, um, I think it was in the scene where they talked to the head of the studio that they're going to get married. And they, uh, the publicity man comes into Jack it. Carson, Jack right. Carson. And... Uh, Anyway, they say they're going to get married, and so they, they have a scene in a little town, Piru, California. They went there to shoot it, where the, they go to a justice of the peace. Yes, and there's somebody in jail. Yeah, and that was the scene that they had, didn't have the guy saying, that's good, I like yeah, it. Yeah, the guy, that was the person in, behind bars behind saying that. Behind the bar saying that. That was actually Judy's uncle. Whose uncle? Judy Garland. That was her uncle? Yeah, playing that part. Really? Yeah. I didn't know that at the time. I found that but out. Was that, was that the scene that you suggested to keep But the I suggested meeting? the end had to be that they didn't go, you know, they went off and got married uh, at the, with the Justice of the Peace. That whole area. Oh, that whole scene you suggested just that scene uh, was scene cut from was, the... Was they weren't, they did a piece of it, but not the whole thing. And you suggested that they to go into more detail. Correct. Anyway, so and that... And the blue pages showed up the next day. And Cukor liked what I had said, didn't say much to me, and I, I worked with him from then on with a good start. They, we had, uh, went down, I went down to the stage and they were rehearsing something, and I'd never worked with a director like that before. I had, but not very much. And the head of the production department, or the unit manager, came and said, Gene, I was talking with Cukor, <laughs> making suggestions on the stage about whatever we were doing then. I don't remember. He said, Gene, get back up in the art department where you belong. Cukor's got enough ideas on his own. Oh, so they're getting a little bit jealous of your... Well, not jealous, but just uh, nothing to delay anything. They thought maybe if I offer ideas, it's going to delay the picture somehow. I see. So I asked, could I tell Cukor I'm going back to the art department. Oh my, that took a lot of nerve. And they said, yes, you tell him. And, and they did. Cukor called the unit manager over behind the set and you could hear him in San Pedro telling this guy that he would make the decisions when I would come or go or stay. So Cukor lost his temper. He lost his temper with this guy. And from the, it was so good for me because he was telling that man in the production department, Gene's going to work with me until I tell him I don't want him anymore. Oh my goodness. So anyway, it was, a, it was kind of interesting, but that's... And that this was, is all during pre-production of A Star is Born. Pre-production of A Star is Born. And so that's how I got on to where I worked daily with Q Corp. So, I, would you sit, so would you sit with him in pre-production once you were hired as production designer? You would do drawings for him and present them do, to do him? do drawings, but that was incidental to just talking about it I, with Q Corp. I could take him on the stage and say, this is our set, and here's how you could do the scene. We could get the camera, and we've got this kind of light coming. We could do this, and we could do that. Camera here. The, the, you know, there are so many beautifully lit scenes in that movie. And what specifically comes to mind, actually one of the most glorious uses of light, in my opinion, is when uh, uh, Esther Blodgett decides that she's not going to... Uh, go with the band anymore and she goes into Tommy Noonan and wakes him up in the middle of the night after she's been out with James Mason and she goes to Tommy Noonan and she into his uh, while he's sleeping to tell him that she's going to stay behind. And that was a very difficult. Uh, Do you, you know what I you are talking uh, about when she goes up the stairs? I worked on that with Sam Levitt. It's so beautiful. Read, it Sam, so beautiful. read Sam Levitt's book. I have. Well, you hear him praising me all the way through it, and, and things I didn't ever expect anybody to publish. And so, so you have so it, it's so wonderful because you have that incredible moment, that wonderfully poetic moment with that beautiful, beautiful light, in conjunction with some of the most glorious underscoring of the man that got away, that you'll ever hear coming together. To it's a perfect example of how greatness is coming together all to make one 
glorious unit, and that's what that's that's what it's all about. When we do, we just do the pictorial side of it and hope that the music right. comes and, and along then, later. And then when, it, when it comes together like that, that's it's, really it's oh, greatness. Yeah. Well, it adds so much. It adds know. so much. Yeah. But that was a very difficult scene to light, to have it come from dark to light, from daylight to dawn. What was it like? What was Judy like on the set? Can you describe what she was like day to day on the set? I know that the production had a lot of trouble. There was a lot of uh, it took a long time to make, and um, were some days she was on, some days she was off, or? Oh, yeah, well, all of that's true. That's for, She was a very difficult, but, but from my point of view, working with her, she was terrific. Cukor liked her. Cukor did everything he could for her. But uh, it was Judy Garland, and Judy Garland had been brought up over at MGM. <laughs> right. And uh, was going to take it out on studios unconsciously, I think. Sure. I don't think she had set out to do these things. Of course not. But she, uh, it was a slow picture. It was hard to get all of the material. Cukor was meticulous about every scene. You know, if he didn't like it, you played it over, you did it again, so you he, did it again. Were there multiple, ta multiple, multiple, multiple takes? Oh, absolutely, I mean, just, with Cukor. Just... Fact is, the studios and the production department did everything they could to cut down somehow get Cukor to stop saying print that and print that and print that. He'd do two or three takes and he'd say print them. And, and so they'd say, well, can't choice. select one? And he would say, I won't, I'll select it when I edit it. So he had to, so he had to print all the takes and then... They would print the takes for Cukor. Yes. And especially with Judy Garland. What was it like, now, did you have challenges shooting at the Ambassador? Did you shoot a scene at the Ambassador Auditorium, Gotta Have Me Go With You? Yes. The musical number? And then you have... Well, we start out ahead of that doing the big opening. With a few extras, we had to shoot those scenes in the auditorium and arrange it so that <laughs> the place was full of, of people. And uh, it was interesting. I designed that set with the, the cowboys in the, you know, the, did it right, with scrims roping, roping in the, the beginning, yeah. yes, that whole thing. Because that stage was built for elephants, I for see. animal acts. And it's huge. Like a Billy Rose circus. And to fill thing. that thing out. And then I love the scene where he comes out drunk and she it, saves him. It's such, it, it's such a, that, we were, um, we were very close friends with Hugh Martin. Do you remember Hugh Martin? I remember the name. He was, he was the vocal arranger on the film who didn't get any credit, unfortunately. I just remember hearing And he did the all name. the vocal arrangements for A Star Is Born. And his favorite shot in that entire movie is the one that you're describing right now when 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 mason walks out on the stage and you see him walking out on the stage and you see the lights and the scrim and all like you're on the stage with him a and horse then, a horse a kingdom for my horse and then you see that wonderful the ballerinas it looks like a renoir painting yeah. almost you can see that's clearly the influence by that was that something you'd work with Cukor that he wanted something uh, absolutely like that? myself and my friend hoinigan hune the russian still photographer that we had on. He was a friend of Cukor's and it, it was quite famous. And uh, Cukor came to me one day and said, you know, what can we do to, so I can get him on the picture What uh, with all the unions. You, he's not in a, any of the unions. So I came up with the idea of being a color coordinator. Now, nobody does color for me but me. But anyway, so I said, well, having a color coordinator. But we had this great mind working with us. And he loved doing things like that, like, like that ballerina. To or, pay homage, or, or, like to pay homage, and to some, pay homage to Renoir Yeah, there's also, like he did in that opening, a, 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 a Picasso with a clown and uh, the whole oh, thing. Oh, yes, yes. So he, 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 he would spend his time doing that. Well, I did all the other things. How do you shoot the picture and how do you design the so sets? So Sam Lovett was the director of the DP he on became, the production? He replaced, uh, and I can't think of his name, the very famous photographer. And, and, and so with... Do you want the story why he did sure. that? Sure. Prior to uh, changing over, we were going to do a scene down at the Biltmore, I mean at the Coconut Grove. Yes. And we went down to the actual, the Biltmore, or wherever. You know, the Ambassador. The Ambassador. And looked at the thing and Hugo said, well, we can shoot it here. And this cameraman, this very important cameraman said, well, fine. I'm doing the gesturing now, but yeah. he said, 
you can have that much. I need this much for lighting. So he's well, telling you what to no, do? No, not me. He's I mean, telling Qcor. Oh, you don't tell him That's what to a do. mistake. <laughs> right. you, know, you tell the director, you got this much, and I need this much to light it. You don't tell the maestro that. He was just saying he didn't want to shoot there, but we, uh, we ended up doing something instead. But that's why Levitt came in. Now, Sam had been an operator on some movies, camera operator, some movies for Judy at, at uh, MGM. At Metro and East. they got to know each other. So Sid so brought she, him into the so project. Sid brought him in, and he couldn't have been a more amenable come to come to me and to Hune and to Cucor on ever, any problem he might have. I just remember one run in. Cucor uh, said, "I said, you know, the lighting is kind of bad." I said to Cucor, "He said, well, tell Sam." So I told Sam. Sam said, "All right, clear the stage. Everybody, get off. Start all I'm over. I'm going to do the lighting now. Start all over again." And I went out and stood next to Sam like this, and Cukor and Judy were watching, and they thought that was terrific, that I wasn't going to be put down by Sam or anybody else. It was not good lighting, and right. I stuck by it. And Sam became my great friend, and, and we respected, you, respected yes. and you read the book, and I'm a, I'm a favorite of his in the movie business. So, so would Cukor come to you to discuss with you your opinions on the lighting, on the entrances? The way that would generally work, I would have designed the set. In addition to all this other stuff, I'm still doing sets, <laughs> the background behind people. A set's a uh, locale for story development. I see. And uh, so that I would, I'm would, i designing that, in the meantime, doing all these other things. But it, the two would work like this. So I would design the set. Even before it was designed, I could lay out with tape on a stage and get Cukor and go over, and Cukor liked to be prepared when he went on the stage with the actors. He didn't want anything, any confusion. He wanted to know exactly what he was going to do. That's where I come in. He didn't like winging it. Not at all, and we did it. I would play a part. He, w I would be the cameraman on the stage with just Cukor going around with his script, reading the things, looking around, deciding to do this, do that lean against the door or I would do that. And so this was that kind of a little rehearsal where Cukor was getting in his head. And now he had done all these other pictures of MGM, but I think they did an awful lot of that for him. And of course he had never done CinemaScope before either. Never or And that's a, whole, that's a whole other ball game, isn't it? Right. To shoot in CinemaScope than four by three. Can you talk a little bit about the born in a trunk sequence? And it, was, that, was that a very complicated uh, scene? To, I know that it, it was an afterthought, is that correct? It was It was an afterthought. Cukor left on a vacation, and I remained along, and we brought in an, uh, another costume designer for that stuff. But that was all, uh, and the trouble with the picture and the cutting that Cukor got very upset about was because the Born in a Trunk was another, my, uh, was a, the same story repeated. And Cougar just thought it was too much, but they thought it needed, Judy needed a song, so it was kind of, and she had done that sort of a, a thing on the stage, sitting in the foreground prior right, to this that was movie. Right, that was her persona at the palace and right. all that kind of thing in her and live so concerts. And so some way or another they all put that together. I see. And so, so you were involved in the Born in a Trunks, you were yes. front and center during the Born in a Trunks oh, sequence. Yes. But, but Mr. Cukor was well, not. Well, Cukor left and we used to start at nine o'clock once he left, we started filming at six o'clock, and we'd shoot all night. And Judy would drink during that period, and I thought she was drinking water, but it was gin. Would you know? Could you tell that she was drinking, or was it? I never found anything, anything. But it was. She was just so interesting to be around, and whatever she did was all right with me. I remember her sitting there, and I was. Swanee, how I love you, how I love you, my dear old Swanee. She was lip syncing, that probably, number, right? Lip syncing. She, no, she was that. She yelled out to her daughter, Lorna. who was up uh, up on the Lorna. stage. Liza. Uh, no, what's her name? Lorna or Liza, probably. Liza. Liza. 
Liza, and she kept yelling, Liza, louder, come on, hit it, hit it. You know, that's the first time I thought, well, maybe she said us on a couple of oh, shots. I see, I see. But it was an interesting, and, and Liza, of course, learned how to hit it. So, so when, you, when she was doing these scenes, she was lip syncing, though, because she had pre-recorded, actually, the vocals. Right. right. So she, she just, uh, and Play, there was nobody. Playback. That, right, it was playback, right. Could you talk a little bit about The Man That Got Away, which was, of course, one of Judy's iconic numbers in her entire career. And I understand that the, the scene was shot three different times with Judy wearing three different outfits, and the camera work was done three completely different ways, and the set design was even different. Uh, could you comment on, on that a little bit? Yeah, it was, uh, it was such a key moment, that beautiful song, da, 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 da. You know, you get to pull those notes out, and you got a got a hit, and that's what it was. And it was so much fun to work on. What Cukor wanted, that he had always liked to do, is something new. When you've got somebody singing with an orchestra with a, instruments, around. So in that, he tried to have the movement always, where he would do it, and I would work with that, with him, where the camera is at the any given moment, and what trombone comes in or what goes around. So we worked that all out. And I always give credit to the grips with the cam dolly. They do two things. They move back and forth and they the camera goes up and down. Yes. Well, to shoot a number like that with Judy and you never knew what she was going to do. Da da you know, and suddenly you haven't got another you're in too close or you're back too far. So we had marks on the stage floor where the rehearsal all morning, no shots. Yes. The first day, and the grips have little marks on the floor, at, at, with Judy in the rehearsal, and you don't know that she's going to do it the same later on. Is that on, why but she that's goes out of focus? Yeah, that that can be part of it because you know, she, that, she goes out of focus in the yeah, master yeah. in the master film. Right. But they did that, and they didn't like her costume. It didn't fit right, and the color was wrong. So that's why we did the second one. So when, okay, when you say they, it's Cukor that has the final say on that. Oh, the final say, but Jack Warner comes into it, uh, uh, the head of the editors that worked there for so long, I can't think of his name. So then they come back to you they, and say, they, hey, look, you gotta no, rethink it. Well, they just get to the production department and tell them to shoot again. So they go out and say, we're gonna shoot it again. So we say, we. Did we erase all those numbers? We put the camera back, and then Judy does it differently. You don't, an artist like that does, doesn't Same have way. a routine no, that she does it. Some people know that you just, I know when I do this, that that's where I am. And with Judy, was on the heart, soul of whatever she was doing. Yes. But anyway, so we got the, which was marvelous to get a chance to do it. And I had seen in the first scene the little bar that was in the background. I didn't like. So for the next time we did it, I put a scrim across the whole bar so that it gave it a completely different impressionistic little look behind Judy and the band and the guys. And she would only have, Cukor only wanted certain things. And so when you look at the total thing, it's sort of a ballet of, of Judy and the instruments and the once in a while a man's head or something. Yes. So that, and that's the final take that they use, what you're describing right now? Uh, that was the second time. And then the, we did, okay. I can't remember why we did it once more, but we did. Well, and I also remember that Tommy Noonan, in, 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 in I think the second shot, was playing an upright piano and not a grand piano, which is a huge difference. I, they had him on, a, oh, they, on they, an upright. Uh, isn't that interesting? I never heard that. Yeah, well, when you look at, because you can see the outtakes now, they're available on home video. And when you see the outtake shot, you see an upright Tommy Noonan playing an upright piano, not a grand piano. What I love about that Tommy Noonan and playing that piano, he made me feel like he was really doing it. He was chewing his gum, you know, yeah. kind of like a piano player, a, poor, a cheap piano player. Exactly, maybe. exactly. Not, uh, not a big band, not a big... Or, no, no. But he played the part well. well it's, like, it's like those... Now, did you rebuild the coconut... Were, were those scenes shot on set at Warner Brothers of the Coconut Grove? Or did you go to the Coconut Grove to shoot those? No, we didn't. You I, recreated the Coconut Grove. Right. It's unbelievable. But that wasn't at the Coconut Grove, that particular scene. That's no, no, no. No, but I mean later on when, 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 when James the, Mason yeah. goes out and, and, and the Major D goes, he goes, he goes, she's Pasadena. 
Yeah. Whatever that. Oh means. well, that's a different. That's still third. That's an interesting thing. A great scene, very hard to get, but got a great scene out of, and just do it in one in that little corner kind of place where Mason's looking. You can see the girls over there. Yes. The, that's, I thought that was a great scene. So that was shot on a soundstage. Then. Yeah. You, and you, you, so, so did you sketch that out, and then, and then, and then tell them how to? I then, think that I did that physically with Cukor and Levitt, and Cukor working with the actors. And they would suggest something, or just be able to do it. And I think we just combined all of that to so get that Cukor, shot. So would Cukor present a concept to you that, and it was your job to execute and fine tune the concept? No. We'd get to come to the concept of the solution to the concept together. So it was a mutual thing. Yeah. So you, you so you weren't scared well, of him necessarily. Listen, I'm then. still a blueprint boy working with this great director, and uh, you know. And I'm doing everything I can as diplomatically as I can. I can't even imagine. Su and suggesting what I find now is very strange and funny that I hear is a blueprint boy, in fact, from Warner Brothers, working with this great director, and on the very first day telling him how to make a movie. And he listened to you. He li listened to me. Yeah, he sure did. Cukor would listen to anybody that came up with a good idea. As I grew in power, I kept everybody away. I'm doing all of this, you know, to keep it going for Cukor. But in one scene, I don't know what picture or something where guys kissing the girl and kissing the girl, and finally, for the third time, what can we do differently? And the grip said, "Why don't you have her take out her earrings so we can kiss her ear?" Cukor did it's in the movie. He listened. But so he listened. He listened. He didn't, he, have, a, he knows he didn't he, have a closed book. He, and no, and he didn't have to uh, apologize to anybody because he, you knew that he knew what he was doing. And if he takes an idea, fine. Were you scared of him? No, I never was. That's what's strange about it. Never intimidated by him? Not at all. And maybe he sensed that. I was, that. I was um, observant of the protocol for directors, I would, this Walter Bernstein that I mentioned, yes. the writer, wrote somewhere, oh, no, he told me in person, I got to know him very well. We did a couple pictures together with Cukor. Walter said, Gene, you're never going to get on anywhere until you call him George. Not Mr. Cukor. Call him George. It's always Mr. Cukor to me, and it was after he told me that. I never changed. The best I did was boss. You never called him George. I never called him George. Cukor told me once, he says, you know what's funny about people in my first name in this business? If I drive in in the morning, the guy at the gate leans in and says, hi, George. <laughs> and other people are afraid to call him George. But it's a, uh, but I, I just respected this man that I'm working with, this famous now, director. Now, it's very tragic and I'd like you to comment on this, that, of course, Mr. Cukor passed away brokenhearted over this film. Uh, and he wouldn't ever look at his masterpiece after it was cut. That's, that's that a long story, about. but that's true. That's it. And does that, does that obviously, that oh, absolutely. makes you heavy-hearted, doesn't it, a little bit, to know that his masterpiece was butchered like that? Right. And it's also my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, what I've heard is that it wasn't really Jack Warner's call. He takes the blame for cutting that movie up. But it was really the board in New York that cut the movie. Not Jack, it wasn't Jack's call. They, I heard that he was in that he was in Europe when that was going on. What happened, as far as I know, nobody really knows the day that it happened. But somebody, a nobody, when they were talking about the picture being too long, and yes. they could, and Cukor had told Jack Warner that he personally and the musical people would come in and do it for nothing, recut, get enough footage out to where it was the right length for Jack Warner. But anyway, they uh, somebody just said, well, if you take reel seven and reel four and you just butt them together, you can cut out 20 minutes. And somebody was stupid enough to do that. The scene, and when 
I was with QCOR the day that we saw the final cut. Where and was that? Where did that take place? I think at Warner Brothers. At the theater. But I'm not sure. I, 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 I'm not sure. But, but you were sitting. All with I know is we were cut. watching it, and as we walk out, QCOR said, "I'm sick," and I said, "Well, you should be. They've butchered. I don't recognize the picture." It isn't a story anymore that we wrote, we've shot. But you saw the original before the cuts. I mean, there was a final print before the before all those cuts. Yeah, but it was well. It was screened in San Francisco and New York, I think. The original, uh, and then the exhibitors bitched about it because they couldn't get enough showings, and that was one of the reasons they cut it down. And that's where somebody came up and says, "Well, why don't you just take real so and so and real so and so and put them together?" Were you, now, were you involved at all in the 1983 restoration that Ron Haver did of the film? Yes, I get credit for that. And do you think do you think it helped a little bit? Would I mean I know Cukor still wasn't satisfied. Well, he passed away before we showed it. I was right I was Radio on that City. committee, and we were doing it and taking stills and right. doing all of that work right. with Faye Keenan. Uh, right. And uh, I, I, I get there's my name is on the right. restoration. I just hoped that we never had a show at the Q Corps because it wasn't anything like the no, original. Like what he wanted. You can't take a still of Judy no. Garland doing no, something and have that represent the whole musical number. Incidentally, you know that footage does exist? That lost footage exists. I doubt it. It does. Nobody's ever seen it, but it does. It belongs to a collector who will not let it out. But people have seen it. That's the. That's a very... I think pretty factual. well. That's why uh, you uh, you know you have, can have a belief two ways. I just believe that with all the effort that we put into it, legally, FBI, everybody else, running down leads of people that had it, and threatening jail sentences yeah. and everything else, and we could never get find anything. It's we found a, a couple of little pieces. Yeah, it's just a shame. But I like working with Ron Haver. He's an interesting guy. I got him in the academy oh, okay. as a member. Okay. Yeah, and so, so what was it like? I mean, can you describe to me what you feel to sit in one of these glorious movie theaters of yesteryear, like a Lowe's or a or whatever it was, and sit there and watch Lay Girls or watch A Star Is Born? What do you feel when you're watching your work like that? Does it, uh, do, do, you, do you take pride? Do you take pleasure? I do if, like, lay girls, and I, I feel that what I did really shows through quite a bit. I worked very well with Gene Kelly. The other, well, there were so many bad times. I, they told Cuco we found it and we restored it. Restored, restored a star. stars born, and yes. we're going to. We were associated with USC School yes, of Cinema, right. and we were going to run it down at USC. This new find that put it back the way it was. So I go down to USC. In fact, as I take Cukor down and drive him down, and enthused about going to see the picture again. The first few, f it wasn't. Five minutes into the film, Cukor got up and said, let's go. Oh, my. We walked, he had me walk out. We went down and walked around USC for an hour and a half till pictures over. He was polite enough to come back to the students and say goodbye and sorry that we haven't got what we wanted you to see and all. But that was a very strong moment. He was brokenhearted. He was, and I felt for him. For that. Well, you had a stake in that too. My goodness, I mean, you're. Yeah, but I, you know, I never was out after any anything. Uh, I didn't have business agents, and I right. mean, publicity. Right. I did have one. Got one. A friend of Cute Course, Dan Musgrove, did a lot of his USC stuff. I see. But I'd I'd get a quip in the, some in the paper, one line, and it was always when. The next day, he would send me the bill. <laughs> <laughs> Here we are with Mr. Allen, and I have the honor and the privilege of holding, as he's holding, his Academy Award that he won for My Fair Lady in the year of 1964, I believe. Is that correct? I was just a child. I can't remember. I think that's right. 64? This is, this is the Oscar. This is part of history. And I'm going to hold it up and show it to our audience. 
and how lucky we are to be able to share this moment. Well, that's that's kind of, it's a good old pal. I had a long time, kept it shined up. Thank you.